We have uh, our keynote speaker, hold on, I have to preach from the pulpit. Because really, on what I have to say in the words of Stanley, not sad. <laughs> but anyways, for enough of our keynote speaker, our speaker, Jenny Lou Watson, lives her life guided by this quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Quote, group, quote by Margaret Mead. Jenny is the founder of Great Dogs, a medical alert mapping service dog program that trains rough collies and standard poodles to serve individuals who live with life-altering generalized mapping disorders, diabetes, and Addison's. As a long-life advocate, Jenny has found Service Dog Aware, a program that informs our community about dogs in public, resulting in unobstructed access to goods and services for all. Jenny and her mapping partner, Miles, a dual-trained medical alert mapping service colleague, are a real world of examples of self-advocacy, living a life without labels, like so many of us, if not already, we have lived lives without labels, myself included. So here they are, Jenny, Lou, Watson, and Miles. But it's so great to see all of you today. I gotta be honest, this is the biggest audience I have spoken before, and I am not as talented as Sam over here. So this is a very tough act to follow. Just do your best. Thank you. <laughs> Sam, I'm going to give you my cards to read if I if I start to falter here because that's okay. I'm good at narrating. I I, I can see that. I am too. <laughs> we have we have a lot of experts in the room. Um, okay. I want you all to take a minute and think about what life might be like if every day consisted of unfamiliar surroundings filled with complete strangers. Would you feel alone, lost, scared? How possible would it be to build a meaningful relationship if everyone, everywhere around you, were unrecognizable? I'd like you to close your eyes. Take a moment to imagine what your identity might be if it was written on a giant billboard. What if your identity were assigned to you by others and you are unable to choose the information about yourself? Imagine what life might be like if you were responsible for carrying someone else's burden for all to see every day, everywhere. Controlling and restrictive. X is a label. 
person assigning it and is a mirror image of how they see themselves through others. X does not define me and X does not define you. In my early 20s, I was struggling to find my way. After just a few weeks of therapy, I was given a dual diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder and agoraphobia, the fear of public places. <laughs> to me, this was not a true diagnosis. Rather, it was a one-size-fits-all stereotype, a label, that served as an obstacle to a better life. I am Jenny Love Watson, and I live with an invisible challenge every day called prosopagnosia, which means unknowing. It's a generalized mapping disorder that impacts my ability to recognize familiar landmarks and grid map places and faces. The human brain is like an Excel spreadsheet, continuously uploading information. Where a wall or a chair exists, your brain uses a grid to send information that you, so that you don't in, trip over or bump into this obstacle. Because my brain does not commit grid maps to memory, I am unable to recognize familiar landmarks, find my way in public places, or retrace my steps. The result of a generalized mapping disorder is relentless and exhausting and disorienting. When I say I'd be lost without my dog, I mean that, literally. I'd lose my car in a parking lot even if it was a block away. I'd be lost in a department for a store for hours, unable to find the front. Once. I even found myself in the men's restroom as I tried to navigate my way to a conference. There are some things you just can't unsee. <laughs> I was glad that audience. Okay. See, I was gifted with a brain. That's Fuse Forum, by the way. I was gifted with a brain that sends mapping that fails to send mapping information to the messaging center. The Fuse Forum is a small and very specialized part of the brain that impacts object recognition, facial features, and geographic orientation. This is the same part of the brain that grid maps people's faces. So while I'm looking at all of you right here, right now, I lack the ability to commit your face to memory, making you, in essence, a complete stranger. I'd like you to introduce you to my partner, Mapping Miles, my medical alert mapping service dog. This is Miles' resume. Miles is a rough collie, and he's specially trained to use both scent and memory to navigate me to designated landmarks. With Miles by my side, I'm never lost. Mm. A little fun thing about Miles, mm. you can stay there. Okay. Sorry. Um, it takes nearly three years and thousands of hours to train a mapping service dog. During that time, Miles has earned the number one collie in the United States of America mm -hmm. under the United Kennel Club. He is a multi-champion and grand champion. He was nominated for a national award called the Shining Star from the Collie Club of America. He has his own flocks, flock of snowy call ducks. I'm trying. Oh, it's not working. Put it back there. There we go. There's Miles Duckies uh, that he tends to daily. Miles is duly trained. In addition to serving me as a compass, Miles is trained to alert to real-time changes in my blood sugar. An early warning detection center that can, Miles can smell these changes and he alerts up to 20 minutes before I feel or even know there's a problem. Nearly all of my self-advocacy effort lies in this dog right here. And I'm sure you can see why. By advocating for my dog, I'm advocating for myself. With Miles by my side, I am now free not only to advocate for myself, but for others as well. One way I advocate for others is a program called Service Dog Aware. 
Service Dog Aware embodies my passion to inform others. It is my aim to help others feel comfortable when they interact with individuals who rely on trained service dogs. Everyone benefits from Service Dog Aware. Information is powerful. Once you become informed, it is impossible to become unaware. There is a point of difference between a pet and a service dog. You're all going to be quizzed on this, so listen up. Being informed will help you advocate for others. So what is a service dog? The Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 has very clearly defined a service dog as a dog individually trained to do work or perform tasks for individuals with a disability. And the disabilities can be any type of disability. Um, no longer are guide dogs the only service dogs or people in wheelchairs have mobility dogs. No longer is that the only kind of service dog. It could be any job as long as it directly mitigates the disability of a person. And remember I said thousands of hours. Miles actually has a better resume than I do. Um, I put my pride in a box a lot, put it on the shelf, and just listen to my dog many times. So in 2011, the definition gained even more clarity uh, that only dogs can become service animals, so they moved the, an the word animal to dog. So no more can you have a little pet monkey or a giant peacock on an airplane. Um, it has to be a dog and it has to be specially trained. Service dogs are permitted anywhere the, do the public is allowed to go, even when pets aren't allowed. So when I was partnered with my first service dog, I hear things like, well, you don't look disabled. Why do you need a dog? Or they'd snap their fingers at me and wave in front of my face. And they would say, excuse me, <laughs> I love dogs. Can I pet him? Or, sorry, you can't bring a dog in here. No dogs allowed. Um, some of my favorites are, I love your dog. I didn't know you were blind. <laughs> and um, I have an emotional support dog, too. I bring him everywhere with me. He is the life of the party. So, I think there's another one Okay, here. So here are ways, this is where I said you're gonna get quizzed, so here we go. Here's the quiz, are you ready? Here are ways that you can be an advocate for others. Number one, when you see a service dog, it is important to speak to the person, not the dog. Number two, always give the dog and handler space to work. You don't have to like veer off into the next street, but crowding them would probably be a little bit rude. Number three, do not distract. That doesn't mean do not pet, do not whistle, do not eye contact. It means do not distract. So just pretend like the dog doesn't exist. That's the best way to do it. It's a very important job to make sure his handler is safe. A lot of people ask me, you know, oh, well, does he ever get to be a dog? Oh yeah, you just saw Miles has his own flock of ducks. That's literally his pastime, that's what he does. He wants to go home, take off his uniform, and go check on his ducks. And he counts them by numbers. He knows exactly which one is which. If anybody's hurt, you know, he's, he's on it, okay? So one of the most rewarding parts, this is the part that I'm gonna try not to get emotional, but I'm not gonna promise anything. One of the most important parts of what I do and the most rewarding parts, the thing that gets me out of bed every day, is my journey to self-advocacy is the impact of not only finding my own purpose, but um, a purpose for others as well. So this is Rachel Clayton. Rachel Clayton, first year is pictured with a dog named Oliver Warbucks. Oliver Warbucks is the first duly trained medical alert mapping service dog that left our program. Mm -hmm. He is a standard poodle. And he lives in Alabama with Rachel. When we first met, Rachel was not partnered with a service dog. She was diagnosed with AMPS, which is a very rare and difficult to diagnose muscular skeleton pain syndrome. Rachel, like me, developed blood sugar imbalances, and it impacted her life significantly. She was partnered with Oliver Warbucks, and through this experience has become an incredible advocate completing her degree in political science at the University of Alabama, as well as achieving internships with the Business Council of Alabama, Department of State Office of Foreign Missions, 
and a U.S. House of Representative congressman. Next slide. Rachel's engaged to be married in February. And she is actually being partnered with her successor dog, Vander, who's the little brown guy on there. And um, Oliver Warbucks is retiring. He is going to be seven years old. In October, um, oh, I already did that. Yeah, I'm rolling. I'm, I'm rolling through. Okay, Austin, here we go. Austin Dixon. Austin Dixon in vain. So <laughs> Austin is 25 years old from Arkansas. He was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when he was 11, and he maintained his passion as a professional cyclist, cycling all over the world, and a student despite his diagnosis. When he was 15. Just think about this for a second. He hacked into his blood glucose meter and wrote a code that would send communications from his blood glucose meter to his computer. During onboarding to be partnered with Fane, Austin's meter would indicate his blood sugar levels, but with a five minute delay. This is the best technology we have today. After being partnered with Zane, I was able to see something truly miraculous. His blood sugar went from the high 300s, so you know, it's gonna be around 80, to 32 and off the chart in six minutes. Zane indicated nearly 20 minutes before the blood glucose meter could catch the sudden changes, allowing Austin to make faster and more subtle changes earlier than technology. Austin ended up in ICU while he was here for onboarding. He got very, very sick. Um, the travel and the change of routine put him in a pretty big tailspin. He had a seizure and we had to rush him to the emergency room. He was in ICU for 10 days at Soin in Charlotte. I mean, <laughs> Charlotte, that's where I was from. At Soin in uh, Dayton. And um, when, he, when he was well enough, he went home without his dog without the life-saving tool because we couldn't finish the training. He was home for four months. He went in and out of ICU again several times. He was diagnosed with a second life-threatening diagnosis of Addison's. When he returned and finally was able to get Zane, he completed in the meantime his college degree <coughs> of computer engineering from the University of Arkansas. And he now has a full-time career at Tyson Foods as a computer engineering software development specialist. He's 26 years old. These are the kind of things that get me out of bed every morning and keep me breathing in and out all day long. I'm not going to mess with our thing anymore. But my AI. I am is where self-advocacy begins. I'm going to share with you what 20 years of therapy gave to me. And it boils down to two or three rhymes my grandmother used to say to me. My first one is, I'm going to try to say it like she did, nanny nanny boo boo, whatever you say bounces off me and sticks to you. The other one is, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words were never hurt. The labels others assign to me are a reflection of how they see themselves through me. Labels do not define me. I am two simple but powerful words. I am is my story. There's three steps to self-advocacy that we follow through our entire lives. First one is discover and advocate. Ask yourself, what works for me? Second is dig, dig deeper. Oh, sorry, back to the first. I work relentlessly, discover what works for me, and I advocate for these accommodations. Miles is considered a reasonable accommodation under the, uh, the, the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, Title One and Two and Three. The Ohio Revised Code supports Miles as a fully trained service dog. The Administrative Code supports Miles as a fully trained service dog. Do you think that that means that I can walk everywhere and anywhere I want without challenge? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. That's why Service Dog Aware exists. 
It helps people become informed, helps them become comfortable when they have to make that accommodation and they don't know what the rules are. We want them to feel comfortable so that when they see me, I want them to have a positive association with me every single time. The second one is dig deeper. I've trained myself to dig deeper and identify the labels others assign to me and remind myself that X does not define me. It defines them. Finally, I transform X's into I am. I'm willing to be vulnerable and share my story with others and learn others' perspectives. I do a lot of researching about why would they feel that way? Why might they say that? Why might, what must they be feeling in order for them to project that onto me? It takes a lot of effort. So we're going to do a self-discovery challenge. Okay. So Tiana, and if you're a liaison for me um, in, in the group that's going to go around the table, raise your hand so people can identify you, or if you want to be a liaison, raise your hand. So we're going to do a self-advocacy challenge. It's going to take us a little bit to get around to your table. I will personally be coming around to all of you also. And, and what we're going to do is we get to choose how the world sees us. So we're going to choose either a label that's already written, or we're going to get to write our own, and we're going to label that. So it's not just our names. We're going to get to choose how the world sees us today. Okay. So I want you to go forward, and I want you to share your story with the world. I want you to live life without labels. I will have a table in the back. If you would like to come up and ask questions, further engage, I will be circling around as you're, uh, you're engaging at your tables. I really want to hear what your stories are and what you choose to adopt as your label, as your I am. Thank you all very, very much for having me here today.